Welcome, everyone. It's great to have all of you with us today. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Marcel Kausten. I'm the founder and the executive director of the Julian Jane Society. Today, I'm excited that we have with us four of the other interviewees from our latest book, Conversations on Consciousness and the Bicameral Mind. These are some great thinkers in terms of theorizing on Julian Jaynes's theory and a lot of related topics. And I'm really grateful and honored to have them with us today. If you haven't yet read the new book, you definitely want to check it out. It delves into a lot of different aspects of Julian Jaynes's theory. It answers a lot of the questions that people have about the theory after they've read Jaynes's book. And I've been getting a lot of emails from people who read it and uh, getting a lot of really positive feedback. So definitely check that out. It's on Amazon. It's on our website and you can get it internationally as well through pretty much any bookstore via special order. I hope you've had a chance to read the panel bios on the website, but I'm just going to take a quick moment to briefly introduce everyone right now. Boban Dedevic is with us today. He's an interdisciplinary technologist and researcher. He studies ancient languages with an emphasis on the development of mental language in ancient history. His master's thesis is from the University of Chicago on the evolution of mental language in the ancient Egyptian story of Sinue. And his interview in the new book is titled The Evolution of Mental Language in the Iliad and the Odyssey. So anything having to do with that aspect of James's theory would be a good question for Boban. Brian McVeigh is with us. He's an anthropologist, a mental health counselor, and a scholar of Jamesian theory. His PhD is from Princeton University, where he knew Julian James. He's published numerous books and articles on James's theory and has several interviews in the new book, including evidence for bicameral mentality in the Bible, which talks a lot about the evidence for bicameral mentality in the Old Testament and the New Testament based on the research that is in his uh, recent book, The Psychology of the Bible. So if you're interested in uh, the biblical aspects of James, James's theory and that evidence, you definitely want to check out his book, The Psychology of the Bible as well. Bill Rowe is here. He retired from UC Santa Cruz, where he worked as a research associate for the Santa Cruz Institute for Particle Physics. He published a four-part article on James's theory in the American Journal of Psychology. His interview in Conversations on Consciousness in the Bicameral Mind is titled The Development of Consciousness in Children. And he's spoken at our last big conference back in 2013 on this topic. And several of his parts of his article were also published as chapters in our God's Voices in the Bicameral Mind book. So we're glad to have Bill with us today. We've got a lot of great people in attendance today too. And I know a bunch of you, but many of you I don't know. So again, just a big welcome to everyone. Well, just to get things started here, Bobin, why don't you tell us a little bit about your research on the ancient uh, Egyptian story of Sinue and how that relates to James's discussion of the pre-conscious hypostases and the evolution of mental language in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Sure. Thanks for the question, Marcel. The story I analyzed for my graduate work at the University of Chicago was the story of Sinue. It's a Middle Egyptian story, and it's about 4,000 years old from about 1850 BCE. And I just counted up the words that related to faculties or what we may call mental language, much like James talked about. And out of all the words, I did find one pronounced yib or jib, depending on how you want to pronounce it, because we don't really know what it sounds like. So I call it yib. But this word appeared most frequently. But it was interesting because it only did so during times of really novel, life-threatening situations for the characters. And it's pretty similar to the Greek notion of vigor or thumos. That, uh, it's a word that, J that James called. And it not aligns pretty nicely with James's model of Greek mind words. But all of this is just expressed in a different language family because Middle Egyptian is a Semitic language, not an Indo-European one. So yeah, that's basically what I got out of that whole research enterprise. Right, and t can you talk a little bit about your other study that you talk about in the book where you compare 
frequency of mental language versus the Iliad and the Odyssey, and you looked at providing more evidence for James's argument that there was a development, this is used to track the development of consciousness via these ancient texts. Sure. So a few weeks ago, I presented these findings at the International Conference on Mental Lexicon in Niagara Falls. And what the study was about is counting up these important mind words that were translated as mind. But in Greek, of course, you have about eight different words that get translated very differently according to the translator. So I compared these among 17 different translators who did both the Iliad and the Odyssey. So from a statistical standpoint, that allowed me to compare all the different averages or the means between all the different translators and of course the original Greek. And to relate this back to James's chapter on the Greek hypotheses, first, James indicated that these words appeared more frequently, and I did find that to be true, the ones that he focused on. Statistically, that's how they came out. And also, James, I believe, was very much accurate when he said that translators don't really know what to do with these words. And I find this in my day-to-day -day research as well. And the third part is the this notion of how these words change over time. And James provided a model that, that can be simplified here as step one, you have words for outside sensations. Step two, these words now get to are used to describe something going on inside the person's body. And in step three, all of a sudden, those internal sensations and those spaces inside people can do very complex things, such as such as you, know, you can hold recognitions in your naos, or you can put vigor in your thumos, which is like heart. And you very much see James's model play out nicely when you compare actually how these words changed from the Iliad to the Odyssey. Great. And your article on this is posted online. Anyone can uh, take a look at that. Any follow-up questions for Bobin from anyone? I've got one. Bill, go ahead. Uh, Bobin, could you say something about the Martindale, I think it is, and Tuck's paper that verified the old versus more recent entities in the Iliad? Sure. I'll just I'll just share what I consider to be some important observations. So the paper you're referencing by Martindale it was a study done by University of Maine. And what they did was they did a study called discriminant validity which very simply is a way to compare two different texts and see how different they are across whatever dimensions you want to measure. Maybe it's word endings or vocabulary. So what Martin Dale and one other colleague did was, was really excellent. They went through, they did this discriminant validity test, but they did it on each of the books of the Iliad and the Odyssey. So what they did was they could get a sense of the authorship based on, I'm sorry, not the authorship, the dating based on the results of their analyses. And it was pretty conclusive that some of the books are older than the others. And it's not a single compos it's not a single composition or single source. It was worked on over time. Some things were added, some things were removed and changed. And in the oldest parts of it, you, uh, which I reconciled as well, in the oldest parts, you don't have many of these mental language terms. That's not in their paper, but that's what I aligned it with. But Martindale's study shows that the authorship of the Iliad and the Odyssey is not straightforward. It's not a single person named Homer as usually believed. So this Homeric question was really expounded upon it. And in fact, the next step for my research article would be to actually mimic the the book by book comparison of certain words, because I think that gives you a more granular picture of the situation. I don't know if that provides enough feedback for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a really important observation on, on your part. 
Thank you, Bobin. Yeah, Bobin has taken a lot of time to learn these ancient languages with the expressed intent of validating a lot of Jane's claims. And this is the kind of research that's really important to really move the theory forward and address critiques and uh, long-held assumptions that uh, might not be accurate. So it's really great work that Bobin's doing. And I encourage you to delve into that both in the new book and in his articles. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, Bobin, um, it's not so much a question I have, but more of a comment. And I was wondering if you could um, respond to this. One thing that um, I think someone would notice if they read what James said about the metaphoric basis of mental language, the body plays a very big role, our physiological responses and how these are put into words. And eventually these words, of course, develop into subjective terms. And in your work, you, I can't remember specifically uh, which project it was, but you pay a lot of attention to the role of the body. And so I was just wondering uh, if you could comment on that. And the, the reason why I think this is important is because this relates to the significance of taking an interdisciplinary approach. And this is why I think for so many people, James is so challenging, because you really have to have your thumbs in several different fields at once to appreciate what he was saying. And one of them, of course, is human biology, human physiology, if you want to understand the growth of uh, metaphoric mind words. So in any case, that's just a comment. I was wondering if you uh, had anything you'd like to say in regards to that. Yeah, so I definitely agree with you. The body plays a very big role in our language and everyday life. In fact, I had a very penetrating discussion with my advisor who challenged me on this very topic. And I would even go a little broader and say that human language is greatly impacted by the body only because this is kind of our shell or chrysalis, so to speak. But really, I think you can safely extend that out to nature as a whole. So for example, look at when you're you know, writing a paper, you have a header, you have your body, you have your footnotes, and you have to take these words, head, body, foot, and you have to just honestly ask, where do they come from? And they certainly come from you know, their corporeal references. And just the last comment I wanted to add was, the work is quite challenging because it doesn't, it is interdisciplinary. So for example, in my thesis on Sinue, what I determined was kind of the, a pivotal scene in the, in the entire story is when Sinue departs Egypt. And if you look very closely at this, you know, at this passage, what's really happening here is palpitation of the heart. You have a very, you have very stressful circumstances and you basically have a description of the fight, flight or freeze emergency stress response. So for that reason, a third of the paper and a third of my research, I had to read anatomy textbooks, biology textbooks that talk about how uh, chemicals in your body get released in certain situations. So yeah, I think it's much more involved and I think that's tip of the iceberg. I think there are probably more layers to this as well. So that's basically what I would add as comments about your great observation about the important role of the body in and using metaphor to generate new meanings. And and Bobin, just to follow up on that, what, what, how do you respond to some of the critiques that the story of Sinue shows evidence of mental language that would challenge the dating of the transition from bicameral mentality to consciousness? Well, I would have to read any challenges specifically before I could comment specifically. So I'll just give some brief observations.